Well, in this session, we're going to be looking at automation as a context for student solutions. So we're going to look at digital solutions or digital systems that students create to solve various problems or to explore various digital solutions as part of their investigation and development of computational thinking skills. Um, a set of tools and activities related to input and input related solutions, automation based solutions, robotic solutions, and drone based solutions. So let's get started and explore this aspect of digital technologies. So first off, digital systems um, involve some binary processes. That's what makes them digital as opposed to non-digital or what we call analog. So when things are digitized, they're encoded with binary code, zeros and ones. So digital music encoded with zeros and ones can then be put onto our computers and our phones and things of that nature. Whereas um, old recordings um, carved into the grooves of records or into the magnetic tape of um, tape recorders used what was called analog signals where it was a continuous uh, variation in intensity of a signal whereas digital is all encoded in zeros and ones and we call that binary or binary code and digital systems are also made up of hardware some sort of devices that are controlled by software the instructions that we uh, place on the devices to have them do different things and they're connected very often to other devices through networks so they're the four aspects that make systems digital they have some sort of binary processes or data being processed um, that is binary they have some sort of hardware devices there's software involved and they may be connected to a network of devices. And in the teaching of digital systems, they form part of the knowledge and understanding strand. And the other strand is data representation, that this aspect looks at digital systems. So what do students need to learn? They need to learn about the components of digital systems, the various hardware that makes up the systems, like a computer. Um, but also the things that are related to a computer, such as what we call peripherals, such as the mouse or the keyboard or the monitor or the printer or scanner. There are a range of other devices that also relate to computers. And then, of course, we have mobile computers, laptops, tablets, mobile phones. And they are all different devices and they often have some of these other elements integrated into them. But there's a wide range of other devices other digital devices. Most of our cameras now are digital. Um, there's a whole range of different musical devices, musical instruments that are digital. So beyond the hardware, there's also the software and the software that runs on the devices. And students need to learn about the software. We don't place a huge emphasis on that, but there are certain software applications that students need to learn about. And in particular, that forms part of their digital literacy. Um, and they integrate that with their other learning areas. So when they need to learn software for doing something in mathematics or in science or in geography or English, they learn about the software in that context. But in digital technologies, they learn about the abstract idea of software. And of course, how to make their own software through programming. And then finally, students need to learn about networks and how the internet and other networks such as in their house work. Now that may be a bit scary to you, so it gets a little bit technical, um, but it is a fundamental aspect of technology today and so students do need to learn about this. Um, so some of these aspects, the hardware and the software and the networks, will be beyond your comfort level and you will need to learn about some of these concepts in order to teach it. We're going to touch upon these things today, but over your teaching career, you will need to investigate these, 
because they also change all the time. Um, tablet computers are relatively recent, as are actually mobile smartphones. Um, and during your time as a teacher, there'll be new technologies that will be introduced. Um, virtual reality and augmented reality headsets and eyeglasses are likely to be something that's quite prominent in the next decade. Um, there'll be a whole lot of implanted devices that will change things again. So we're looking at where the technology is right now and a little bit about how it was in the past. But the main thing is preparing students for the technologies that are going to emerge into the future so that they can take advantage of these and be successful in a world where we're permanently connected to the internet through implanted devices. Now, we don't know if that's where things are going to go, but it's a possibility. Okay, so in the early years, students learn about the different types of hardware and software that exists, and a little bit about how data is transmitted between various elements of a system. So saving things to a flash drive or to a hard disk or to the internet. Uh, there's ways of transmitting information between devices, um, sending some a file and attaching it to an email and sending it to another device via that mechanism. And then as they go up into the years, they we then start looking at the more technical processes. How does a network work and how can we actually transfer these files through various network processes? So in years one and two, specifically students need to identify and explore how digital systems and their components are used for purposes. We always need to remind students and ourselves that technology always needs to have a context and a purpose. It is a tool and a, a tool is used to do something. That may be to send an email, to communicate with someone, to communicate with their grandmother. And then they would look at the various tools that are available to do that. It may be making a web page, maybe making a video, it may be writing an email. There are various options, various different tools, digital tools that we can use to achieve that. It may be contacting them via video conference. Um, so there are some different approaches. Now, these are what are called elaborations in the curriculum. And we need to remember that the elaborations are options. They are optional ways of addressing the core content descriptor. So this is the content descriptor, identify and explore digital systems and their components for a purpose. And then the elaborations give us a range of different ways of doing that. But they are only examples. You can come up with any way you wish that addresses the content descriptor. But be guided by the elaborations to know really what the intent of the content descriptor is and the sort of level that you should be aiming at. Of course, sometimes we can misinterpret the content descriptors and different people can have different interpretations. So that's where the elaborations can assist. So let's look at some of the elaborations for years one and two. So the first is looking at what are the essential services needed in Outback Australia so that First Nation Australians can watch TV. Here in the cities, we put up an aerial you may know that we have an aerial on our roof and we have that connected to our TV and it allows us to watch TV. But not everyone has the advantage of doing so. Some have to use satellite TV or other different forms, microwave, but let's just focus on satellite TV. That's probably the main one. And so students could explore how that is used and how they need a dish and it has to connect to a satellite, which then connects back down to a ground station, which is connected to the network that we're used to that transmits television signals. But even the idea that television signals are transmitted from somewhere to our TVs is something that's going to be new for our younger students. So learning about the idea that information can be transmitted from one location to another through digital devices. Now, the other approach is looking at how they might get access to their YouTube videos may come through their TV, but it may come through their broadband network. And they download it from a website or view it on a website um, rather than having it broadcast to everybody and accessed in that way. So some other approaches, 
looking at naming all the different devices and how they're used. So just getting an awareness of the range of digital devices that students have available to them. Uh, digital cameras, keyboards, speakers, webcams, uh, headphones, microscopes, a whole range of different tools that just in their classroom or in their home, they would be able to engage with and learn about. But recognizing those that are digital and the fact that we can sometimes use them for different purposes. So for our example, our smartphone can be used as a camera, it can also be used as a recording device or a music player. And the final approach given as, as a suggestion is on how to use these different devices and in particular, how they might have particular settings and processes that students need to learn about in order to make them function. Now, the old joke is learning about how to use a, a video cassette recorder. Of course, that was relatively complex and often children could use them, use it much more effectively than adults. Of course, they had to learn and memorize various um, keystrokes or key commands in order to make different things happen. And that's the same with much of our software and hardware devices. There are a range of different options available within these devices that you need to learn about in order to make the devices do various things, increase their functionality and their um, general applicability in different um, circumstances. Um, so having students learn about how a different app can do different things, in this case, looking at camera apps, or how a more complex SLR camera has various options to control um, focal, focal distance and all the rest. Now that may be beyond some students, but it may be an area where some students do have an interest. It may be some of their toys have various interfaces and instructions that have to be learned in order to make them function. So you can pick the level of technology for the competency level of your students and have them explore um, what's involved with making those technologies do different things. And this is part of understanding the digital solutions that exist for them. Now, another aspect of digital solutions is ways that we represent data in different um, forms uh, through pictures, symbols, numbers, and words. Now, in the last session, we looked at the idea of using Braille and um, semaphore and Morse code as different ways of communicating. Now we're looking at how we can actually represent that data in different ways. So emoticons can represent different images that tell a particular story, as can weather images. There can be a whole range of different ways to communicate ideas using different symbols and numbers and pictures and words. We have different languages. We have different number systems. Uh, the Roman numeral system versus the Arabic numeral um, numeral system. So these are things that can be explored by our younger students. Now, some examples of how to approach doing this. The first is looking at different um, phenomes and looking at how different combinations can represent different sounds. Again, a way of um, taking some information and encoding it and representing it in different ways. And they'll be doing this as part of their literacy learning. But in digital technologies, we're focused on understanding that it's a set of symbols that represent different ideas and concepts and can be used to communicate and transmit information. Of course, eventually we want students to then start exploring how digital devices can use different symbol sets. And in particular, we're going to be looking at binary, but there's also hexadecimal and octal. There's a whole range of others as well that they'll get to explore in later years. So again, another example, having students look at the way we can use different representations for the same meaning. So how in Morse code, we can have some dashes and dots represent a letter. And we can also use um, various other symbols format. This is case um, an eight, eight bit or eight, um, eight zeros and more, eight images, um, what do we call that? Eight boxes, let's call them eight boxes. And they can be used to be shaded or not shaded, in this case, two different colors. 
and in combination then they can re represent all the different letters of the alphabet. Now one of the activities we can do with um, children is to make up various ways of encoding information, having codes so that they can send secret messages to their friends. Because if they make up a particular way of transmitting information that no one else knows except the person that's going to be um, decoding the information, then they've got a secret language that they can use um, to send messages to one another. And another example is looking at how uh, First Nations people used various symbols to represent various concepts and communicate data. And in particular, we're going to look at the idea of, in this example, of seasonal calendars, which are a special way of communicating information about what is occurring in various seasons, what plants are flowering or coming into um, fruit, and what animals might be then available for hunting. And uh, First Nations have a particular way of describing that called seasonal calendars. So this is sort of what they look like. You've got your various seasons, um, as we would have in a more traditional calendar, um, done as like a clock. So each quarter represents a quarter of the year and various um, events regarding plants and animals occur at different times as the year progresses. We can see that a little bit more in this diagram. So it gives an indication of when the monsoon might be, particularly in northern Australia, um, when it's be considered wet and when it's be considered dry, when it's going to be cold, when it's going to be hot and dry, cold and dry, uh, when there's going to be more storms, and then when there's certain plants and animals that are available for hunting and, and so forth. And each area of Australia has a different one. Of course, they have different um, seasonal variations and also different plants and animals that are available in those areas at different times of the year. And so by interpreting these particular um, diagrams, we can gather a fair amount of information about what's needed to survive in those environments. So another way of communicating data and information. Now I'm skipping years three and four. You can explore those on your own. But now let's look at what would be required in years five and six. So the first again is around investigating um, digital devices. In this case, the main internal components of common digital systems and their functions. So getting into the bit more technical aspect, what are the bits inside these digital devices and how do they work? Now, something that not a lot of people know about, but it's important when we come to try to develop solutions to problems that students understand how these devices work because they may want to change how they work or they may want to suggest improvements or differences or it may just be understanding that a device won't do what they want it to do and they need to then search for another device now in order to be able to do that they need to understand at a reasonable level how the devices actually work and to do that we need to teach them so let's look at some approaches for addressing this particular content descriptor. So the first is looking at how digital systems are made up of parts and how they perform various specific functions. For example, how the, uh, the computer processor, the central processing unit, the CPU, uh, controls how a tablet performs calculations and manipulates data. Now that's actually a pretty hard thing to learn. Uh, it's reasonably complex. Now, there are some diagrams, which I've given you a couple of examples here, and there are some video clips um, that show some of those processes. But it's a reasonably difficult um, concept to teach. I didn't learn this until I actually went to university. So now we're teaching it in years five and six. So how can you go about doing that? So the next um, approach gives probably a more um, student-friendly way of engaging with this. This is setting up a role play, a role play game where students take on the role of various bits of data moving around a digital system and recording how it changes as it goes through various components of the system. Quite a complex set of ideas, looking at how the central processing unit changes 
um, information, how the arithmetic logic unit, the ALU, changes things and puts information into digital memory, and how the computer displays various bits of information onto the screen. Um, but by turning it into a role play activity that students can work through and move around various locations and do various actions, it can become a little bit more understandable. And in the extension material for this week, I've given you an example of how to do that for um, understanding a digital system and also understanding how the internet works, which is another complex set of ideas and concepts that students can benefit through a role play experience rather than just trying to unpack the concepts. But another approach is looking at how these components can actually help solve problems. So how the various functions of a telehealth system, being able to set up a healthcare system that works remotely so that nurses can get access to doctors and doctors can interact with patients even though they're not in the same location. Um, and so in this example, exploring how ultrasounds are being used in remote communities where they often have very basic uh, medical support, but they have got access to the internet and to webcams and to ultrasound devices. And these can then be utilized by relatively inexperienced staff, but then um, linked to experienced medical staff remotely to be able to provide them with those services. So again, looking at all the different components of those systems and how they work, how the ultrasound works, how the video conferencing system works, um, and how it all links together, could be a way of approaching addressing that um, content descriptor. So and likewise, in years five and six, we have a data-based um, aspect as well, examining how digital systems form networks to transmit data. So now we're starting to look at how these networking systems work. It may be how a school network works, or how a home network, or how the internet works. And networks can be looked at from a whole range of different approaches. Um, but the suggested mechanisms for addressing this, the elaborations, are looking at how we can connect systems up in different ways to exchange data. For example, how laptops can be connected with cables to other devices, or they can be connected to a network through um, routers and um, modems and so forth to transmit via radio waves. And there are a range of other different ways as well of connecting various devices, microwaves or Bluetooth. There's, there's a range of different um, non-physical approaches. Or even physically moving USB drives from one device to another device. That is a way of networking. It's just a very slow way of networking. Um, but learning about how these devices can interact and interrelate can be a very important aspect of students' learning. And another approach to this is, as I mentioned before, doing a role play um, setup where students take on the experience of being a packet of information being transmitted through a network and how they have to pass through domain name servers and routers and modems and all the different devices um, and how um, bits of information that go through different pathways to get to the computers that they need to get to. And they have to have addresses, which are the DNS addresses and relatively complex again. But it is something that you need to teach your students. So there are videos and books and um, examples that you can have students work through. But a role playing environment does tend to be an effective way of allowing students to gain a conceptual understanding of relatively complex ideas. Another um, elaboration example is looking at how we can still communicate when we're in remote locations. So again, relying upon satellites or um, cell phone networks, even the idea of cell phones, but why we call it a cell phone um, or cellular phone is to do with the mobile phone towers 
creating a zone of communication, which is a cell, um, that these all connect to other cells. And just like, say, in our skin, all of our cells form a surface that forms the whole skin. So do our cell phone towers. They form a surface or a, a network of interconnected communication. But that doesn't work remotely, where our cells will be separated, separated from one another by large distances. So there we have to have another way of connecting our cells, which might be micro, microwave towers, which transmit from one tower to another tower over long distances. It may be radio waves, which bounce off our atmosphere and back down and communicate over long distances. Or more, co more commonly today, we have satellites in orbit that we can connect to and transmit back down to where the information needs to go to. Um, but there are different types of satellites. There are what's called geostationary satellites, which are always um, above the same spot on Earth. As the Earth rotates, it rotates with. Um, but increasingly, there are what are called low Earth orbit satellites, such as the um, Starlink network, um, where we can have satellites quite low compared to geostationary satellites, which are much, much higher. And these satellites can then connect to small satellite receivers we can put on our cars and um, in our homes and even to mobile phones. Uh, at the moment, you have to have specialized mobile phones that can connect to the satellites. But these low Earth orbit satellites um, in the next few years will be able to connect to almost any mobile phone. And that will change things quite dramatically and it will no longer have um, black spots where there's no cell tower. So wherever you are, pretty much in the world, you'll be able to connect to um, the network of satellites and maintain communication. Okay, so that's a few of the aspects of digital systems. But one of the big advantages of digital systems is they allow us to do things in ways that computers are really good at. And computers are really good at doing things really quickly and very really accurately and really um, systematically. So that they'll always do things the same way each time. We know that because we write our computer programs and we know that the, pro the program will be followed exactly the same way each time. If we've written the computer program correctly and haven't made any mistakes or introduced things that might go wrong. So that allows us then to automate things. And automation is one of the key drivers of the success of the technological revolution that we're facing. So now we're going to look at different ways we can automate processes and the different technologies and tools that students need to understand about in order to automate them. But first, just to consolidate what you've learned, I want you to have a look at a little video clip that explains some of those aspects of the components inside a computer and how they work in a little bit more detail. So have a look at that and then we'll come back and explore automation. Okay, so hopefully you've had a nice understanding of how the insides of your computer work in a little bit more detail. There's a lot more to learn about. But then again, there's a lot more time for student learning beyond primary school that they'll go on and explore more and more complex ideas. That said, there is still the expectation that in certainly in years five and six, students do learn quite a bit about how the insides of computers work. Now, the good thing is at that age, students are quite receptive to learning about those things. They like learning about the intricacy and, and complex ideas within their capabilities. Some things are beyond them, but they certainly are much more interested in those things than I tend to find most pre-service teachers are interested in learning about how the insides of computers work. Okay. Whoops. You've already watched that. So let's look now at the idea of automation. Now, the first step in automation is having what's called input processes, where something is telling the computer to do stuff. Now, we can have our programs tell the computer to do things, but we often also want to be able to change that. 
So being able to use our keyboard or our mouse or our touch screen to give the computer other instructions that we're telling it to do things differently to what the program might necessarily do if it didn't have any other input. But we can also attach what are called sensors and peripherals. Sensors allow the digital device to take in information about the world around it. And it might be something simple like a temperature sensor, or it might be a video camera that can detect images like someone's face or when someone has moved into a field of view. But there are hundreds of different types of sensors, uh, tilt sensors that tell if something's um, changing um, its orientation. On a mobile phone, for example, now we have GPS sensors, which will tell us where in the world our phone is. Uh, we might have what are called accelerometers, which will tell us if we've dropped our phone or how fast we're going. Nowadays, some of our mobile phones will have sensors that will detect our heart rates or our respiration rates, um, even blood pressure and a whole lot of other different sensors that can be attached to different digital devices. Now, the medical field is a good example of that, where most hospital beds now have got dozens of sensors that attach to the patient so that we can tell how the patient is going how their heart rates and their respiration rates and their temperature and a whole range of other things are progressing. And that can be all transmitted back to the nurse's station or can highlight warnings and um, alert doctors and nurses if something goes um, abnormally um, in terms of inputs into those sensors, such as if the heart rate is detected to be increasing too much or in worst case, it's, it's stopped. Um, so these are things that we can incorporate into our digital devices to allow them to do other things. But, and many of these are what are called peripherals, which are things we attach to a digital device to increase its functionality. And peripherals can be inputs and also outputs, but we'll focus just on the inputs at the moment. So you've had an experience with one of these sensors already, which is our interface boards, which are the makey makeys, where it's simply a little device which we can attach to our computer and instead of having signals come through from our keyboard or mouse, we can also have them come through by making plasticine or alfoil connections and increase the ways that we can interact with a computer. So empowering students to understand, they can tell the computer information and it will then act on that information through the programming code that they have incorporated to respond to those inputs. Now, we can have more complex input devices. Uh, the code bug is a popular one in schools, which has a number of buttons. So it's a little bit like the Makey Makey, but it's got some buttons built in and also some LED lights. So it can also act as an output device and sort of show images. Um, this is what's called a microcomputer. It allows you to program it to do different things, uh, to follow some instructions. More powerful microcontrollers um, are things such as the Arduino boards, which are quite low cost little um, digital devices that will often find in toys and games and printers and other things where it needs a little computer in there to do things, to follow some instructions, but it doesn't need a full blown computer. It doesn't need a screen and a keyboard and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it does need some processing power to be able to do things and to take some information in and relate to some sensors. And these can be quite low cost. Um, and then you can buy sensors that you can attach to these devices that can then respond to. Um, such as in the activities you'll be doing next week, where you'll be um, exploring how to take in information from a water sensor and have it respond to different water levels for a plant. So letting know when the plant has got dry soil or moist soil. Um, and then it can give a warning or send some information like an email saying it's time to water your plant. So these are ways that we can build little solutions to problems using small microcontroller devices. So some of the sensors, talked a bit about these already, but you might have a flame sensor. So you could make a device that sends you an SMS or an email when a um, flame is detected. So you could build a little um, uh, heat sensor. 
you can have magnetic field sensors so detect if um, magnetic field is changing so that can be used say for tracking how a, a toy car is moving along and how far it's moved um, temperature sensors and humidity sensors and um, light sensors and, and moisture sensors can be built into making a weather station um, infrared sensors and light sensors and ultrasonic sensors can be built into making a security system so that when it detects movement or changes in the environment it can then sound an alarm and let you know when um, your little sister's snuck into your bedroom things of that nature students love building little um, solutions to problems using these different sensors that they can then attach to a microcontroller with a little bit of programming code so that then it does different things depending upon what the sensors indicate Now these, again, microcontrollers can be very um, low cost, less than $10. And so it becomes within the realm of possibility for students to purchase their own or to have the school purchase them and give them to each of their students. Whereas more complex devices often get into the 50 to 100 to $200 range, which becomes a little bit too onerous to pass the costs on to students or to have class sets, although many schools do. Now, with these expansion boards too, they can be, sorry, these uh, microcontrollers, they can also have expansion boards, which just attach to them and increase their functionality, such as having what's called a motor controller, which we can then attach motors to it and then make a remote control car or a small robot. Um, you can have music players that can then play music out to, um, through speakers. You can attach communication systems to them, such as Wi-Fi, so that you can have it then transmit to the network and um, so if it detects a temperature change it can then send an email out across the network to you wherever you are in the world letting you know that the temperature has changed in your house um, and so forth there's a whole range of different um, attachments peripherals that we can attach to our microcontrollers such as cameras or lcd panels or um, gps systems so again they allow students to solve different problems based on quite low cost um, devices and the attachments we can incorporate into them. This is the um, robot um, chassis. So you get some wheels and some motors and some various um, other bits of plastic and so forth. And you can then connect them to your low cost Adreno board. And for around about $20, the cost of the uh, um, microcontroller and the cost of the um, wheels and the motor kit, you can then build a a little robot now students do have to build it that's complex um, and probably too complex for really young students but certainly in years five and six it can then become a design and technology activity in itself learning about how to actually construct such um, devices and this is an example of the sensor modules so for um, again 30 or so dollars you can get 45 different sensors um, you can do a lot with that. You can have your own laboratory where students can try different sensors for doing different tasks and explore different ideas in terms of solutions to different problems through various sensor options. Okay. Now, one of the problems though with these really low cost kits is that they sometimes require some soldering. Not always. Many of them are simple enough that they don't, but at some point, they probably do and that gets a little bit beyond what we would do with young children um, certainly by years five and six they're probably at the level where we could um, reasonably safely introduce the use of soldering but in the main it's a little bit beyond what most teachers are comfortable with and that's understandable so there are slightly more expensive kits that instead of having to connect um, little components up and solder them together they have magnetic connections or other forms of connections where they just plug in together and you can do the same things um, with these slightly more uh, com um, not more complex but more expensive kits because they've had to increase the cost by adding these connection devices so there's a trade-off between co convenience and price um, now the little bits kits are probably the most common in schools and there are hundreds of different components in these and they all connect with various magnetic connections 
um, even the wires have got little magnets on each end so you just connect them the wires or the magnets on the wires up to other connections and they form then a connection without having to worry about soldering or any of the other more com complex aspects and they allow you to do a huge range of different solutions to problems all the way up to home automation with um, uh, home networks and everything else but there's also conductive ink which is another approach whereby you have little components and then you use a, a pen to draw the wires and the, the ink in the pen actually has some metal in the ink which then as it dries forms essentially a wire and students can draw their network now it's a little less permanent a um, little bit more finicky but it's a reasonably good way of teaching students about how uh, how to connect various devices up and to build um, different circuits okay now getting beyond the microcontroller we then start having what are called microcomputers now these are a little bit more powerful they can be attached to say a tv and you can run software on them you can play games on your tv using a, a little micro computer and you can attach a keyboard and so you can type up your assignments and use it as a word processor and a whole range of other things again they're reasonably low cost and they have a, a very simple operating system so it's nowhere near as complex as windows or the um, apple operating system and things of that nature but they can still run some reasonably complex software but they can't run microsoft word and things of that nature but they do have their own little word processors they can run simple games um, they can run minecraft for example they can run um, the video games that children in the 80s and 90s played on these computers so not the latest um, hyper hyper graphic um, computer game but they can play space invaders and tetris and all of those and indeed program their own versions of those games using these more simple microcomputers. Now, the other advantage is being simplified, they are easier to understand and for students to understand how the various components work to form digital systems. So the two main ones, um, the most powerful would be the, the Raspberry Pi microcomputers. And then there's also the micro bits, which are, they're not quite a, a microcomputer they're probably more um, an interface device still but they're reasonably powerful and you can attach them to a tv and to various other devices and, and do a lot of things and create very simple games and things on them but the other advantage is they're much cheaper and indeed so cheap that the bbc british broadcasting corporation which was famous in the 70s for providing every student in the beginning of high school with a computer has also provided every year seven student in the United Kingdom with a microbit computer to allow them to learn um, digital technologies. So they're around about 30 or $40, so reasonably cheap still, whereas a Raspberry Pi is at least $100, sometimes um, more, or sometimes less, sometimes more, depending where you, where you get it from. So the advantage of microcomputers are though, that you can have, um, it can do, everything a real computer can do a full computer can do just at slightly lower capacity that doesn't have as much memory um, the screen is going to be blockier it's going to be low lower resolution as we call it um, but it can still do many things just not everything the other big advantage is if students have it they then have their own computer they can then program it they can then use it to do doing their homework and assignments and it can be quite low cost but they can also change it and modify it and because it's low cost they can take those risks whereas much harder to do that with a tablet or a more expensive computer or laptop the step up from that is students actually making their own computer kits or computers from kits and there are quite a quite a range of these kits available um, again most of them simply work off a Raspberry Pi or Adreno or Microbit that's inside them but they have what are called the peripherals and the case and a little screen that all connects together and students have fun building them 
Um, and again, they're being used in many schools for students to learn about digital systems by the process of understanding, okay, we have to connect our keyboard in this way and it connects and we have to connect a screen so that we can show information. If we want to have sound, we have to connect a speaker. If we want to be able to talk to the computer and have it respond to our voice, we have to connect a microphone. And they're learning about how digital systems work by building them, which tends to be a more effective process than by just watching videos or um, reading about them or having a teacher tell them about the different components of a system. OK, so that's um, input devices and the various computer systems that relate to that. And I've got a couple of little videos for you to look at, one on micro bits and one on little bits, so that you can have a, a little bit more of an understanding about these particular approaches to learning about digital systems. So have a look at those for a couple of minutes, and then we'll come back and look at the next step in understanding digital systems. Okay, so hopefully you've had a little look at the micro bits and sorry, the little bits and the micro bits. And now we're going to look at automation in a bit more um, specific way. So when we automate processes, we use an algorithmic process. Now you've been learning about that throughout this course. We have algorithms that describe step-by-step -step processes for a computer to follow those instructions as described in an algorithm to perform various tasks. So that's what we call automation. So your car door opening, when you press a little button on a um, car door opening device, is a process of automation. There's a little program in that device that when the button is pressed, it sends a signal through the transmitter to the car, which has a particular code that responds to that particular car. When it sees that code, it then unlocks the door. That's a program. Students could write that program quite easily. It's a relatively simple little program. But we can have other programs that do other things, such as turn lights on um, to have traffic lights. So when a car is detected and it approaches the intersection, it then checks to see if there's cars coming through, and then if there's not, it changes the lights from red to green. Uh, there could be a whole range of different things that students could explore around that. Um, having sprinklers turn on, watering a garden have been automated for many years. Um, we have a little timer that sets the sprinklers off at certain times and turns them on and turns them off after a, a preset amount of time. More complex ones now also measure the amount of moisture in the soil. And so it will turn off once they've been watered sufficiently. Um, sometimes they'll turn on when the soil becomes dry enough. And so that whole process can then be automated. So it's not then reliant upon you setting a physical timer, but it's taking sensor information from the real world in terms of the moisture levels in the soil. But there might be other sensors that you could have that will close your windows when it detects rain. Um, and various other approaches like that. Solving problems through automated processes. That's what we focus on in digital technologies. Okay, so increasingly we have these complex alg algorithms that create automations for us to do more and more complex things, such as building a car with robot arms, um, putting different pieces of the car together, screwing various nuts and bolts in to, to make that device. Milking machines for cows, having the cows come in and then automatically attaching devices to their udders and milking them for a preset amount of time and then detaching everything and giving them some nice hay and then allowing them to go back out into the fields. So there's lots of different ways that we can automate processes. Automatic pilots in planes have been around for a number of years now, whereby it can almost take off and land the plane completely without the pilot having to do anything. Of course, all those processes have been worked out. There are enough sensors that can detect the height above the ground and the direction the plane's going and the wind speed and the storm and weather conditions. 
so that it's having enough information just as a pilot would have in terms of knowing what's happening in the world around it that the plane can then follow instructions on how to land so the general um, truism of computers is that if something can be automated eventually it will be and most of the things that we do in the world can be automated there are still a few that we're not quite sure about how to automate yet but increasingly they're becoming rarer and rarer including many of the things in most professions including teaching so we need to think about what are the processes that we can automate for our benefit say automatic marking or automatic role taking things that can free us up to do other more focused things that um, can make better use of our intelligence and our flexibility whereas things that can be automated such as bill paying and tax collection that could be more and more automated so we don't have to go through those processes all the time of course there's some things we want to keep control of and we want to keep oversight until we're confident that the automated processes work as they should um, traffic lights for many many years were um, treated with great deal of suspicion because people didn't know how they worked they pressed a button and after a certain amount of time cars magically stopped but did you really trust that um, but over time we've become familiar and confident that things will occur of course some of us question whether or not the traffic lights actually do work when we press the walk sign but sometimes they do and sometimes they don't actually um, depends upon the situation and how they've been automated to respond to the needs of the problems of that particular intersection but unless we understand the technologies involved unless our students understand how things are automated then it remains magic to them and they can't then control and develop better ways of doing things in terms of automation okay so again that's the main focus we want to prepare our students to be able to cope in a world where it is going to be increasingly automated and they need to be enabled to be able to create their own solutions with such automated processes so they're not just reliant upon how other people have automated things for them that they can change things and we see that let's take the old um, recording um, the VCR the video cassette recorder if parents didn't know how to automate the processes in that they had to rely upon their young children to set the time and to record their favorite show um, and to make sure that that was then recorded so that they could watch it later they weren't empowered to be able to do anything with that technology while their children were and increasingly we're seeing that with many new technologies okay home automation going beyond the vcr is a good example of that many homes now have devices where we can speak to various um, linked devices or and it will turn lights on and turn tvs on and turn the air conditioning on and, and adjust the environment to how we would like like it to be and this is called home automation um, and by linking all these devices together we can set up more and more complex um, sequences of commands so we can say good night and it will then turn out the lights turn off the tv um, turn on the security system um, and set the coffee maker and the bread maker to make bread and coffee at 4 a.m so that it's ready at 6 a.m for when people are getting up these are the things that can be automated in the home systems and increasingly we're seeing this go into other systems most notably at the moment our transport networks where we're seeing automation occurring in our vehicles such as we now have a lot of driver assistance um, automated processes that will let us know if we're too close to the vehicle in front to be able to stop in time based upon the speed we're traveling or if there's something coming into our blind spot or if an object is coming from the side of the road say a young child running out into the path through the use of different sensors and automated algorithms the vehicle is now able to respond to a whole range of different things 
that in the past we had to rely upon humans to respond to the driver had to respond to those things and to notice them in time to be able to make adjustments and in the near future we've got the promise of automated driving where the vehicle will make much more decisions about road conditions and weather conditions and what it's seeing happening around it with radars and cameras and other sensors so that it can drive us from point A to point B using its digital maps um, without any human intervention required at all. Now that's still in development, but it's certainly being tested and explored very rapidly. So how can students get involved with these sort of home automation processes? Well, all the home automation devices have interfaces where you can program and code and provide algorithms and instructions to have it do various things. But there are also some centralized tools. One of them is If Then Then That, which is a website that will take inputs and provide outputs. So it takes information from various sensors and devices that are connected to the internet at, at home. And based upon various inputs from those devices, it will then output signals, output instructions and algorithms to other devices. So you could have one device in your home that when um, your mobile phone is within range of your, comes into your home wireless network, it will then open the door for you and greet you and turn the lights on and turn the TV on to your favorite channel. Um, let your parents know that um, the child has arrived at home and start the dinner cooking in the microwave if these are all connected up to the internet. So that can be programmed by the child or by anyone if they know how to use these devices and these services. So one of the activities you're going to um, do for your tutorial or before your tutorial is to program um, the if then then that so that it will detect on a certain date um, that the date has arrived and send you an email message to remind you of, a, of an anniversary. A very simple use of the device um, but it showcases the connectivity that can be involved in creating these algorithms and you'll also see all the other devices that are available as inputs and outputs um, when you look at the if then then that um, interface so there are various other um, what are called automation hubs um, that are specific to particular companies such as Google Nest and uh, Amazon's Echo devices and um, Apple has their own HomeKit device or environment um, and they allow you to connect devices to them and also tell other devices what to do based upon what's happening with other devices that are having inputs into the system. Okay, so of all those different types of devices then, students can then start thinking about how they can solve problems with those. Now, in some schools, they're beginning to connect devices up. Um, many schools now are getting devices related to their security systems and their lighting systems um, to turn off the lights at various times. Schools don't have a lot of these devices yet, but they are getting more and more. A lot of schools are putting in place um, environmental sensors that will measure the CO2 levels and the temperature and the humidity levels in classrooms and collecting that data. Um, they're not doing a lot with that data just yet, but that's certainly an aspect that can be um, automated. So it may be that the windows or the air conditioning will change depending upon the environmental conditions in the classroom. So the teacher doesn't have to worry about going around and opening windows and changing the the air conditioning settings if it gets hotter or colder or too much co2 builds up in the classroom during the day it can be all automated okay so that's just the if then then that algorithm um, you have if this happens so some sort of trigger then that happens some sort of action in response to the trigger okay Time for another quick break and for you to have a look at a 
uh, video clip on how if then then that works. Of course, you're going to be doing this for one of your activities. It's a little bit longer, but um, have a look at it. And I suggest you also look at the web page while you're watching the video. And then we'll come back and explore the next, next aspect of automation. Okay, so hopefully you're a little bit more aware now of what if then then that involves and can see some of its potentiality. Now, we don't tend to use it a lot with students in schools. Of course, it's connecting to the outside world and to real devices, and that starts getting a bit scary for students um, or for, for teachers and administrators. But these devices are going to be more and more part of everyone's homes and part of our schools and workplaces. So students do need to understand them and they can certainly be used in the abstract or with other less interactive devices. Okay. Now the next aspect of automation is robotics. <coughs> this is being able to actually automate some sort of device that can physically do things physically move around or physically build things or do more than just what a computer or an app or a tablet can do that's relatively static. You can think of an automatic vehicle as a robot. It's not that much different, but um, we're going to look at what really is a robot and what it involves. But essentially, the focus of automation has been traditionally around replacing workers when they have to do dangerous or repetitive work that relies upon a lot of doing the same thing over and over exactly the same way. So where it needs to be accurate, but unvarying. So not particularly creative. So robot arms have been around and used for that for a long time, um, for the automotive industry and so forth. There's been a lot of use of robotic devices in the farming industry and in the mining industry. Of course, again, it often involves relatively repetitive um, activity that needs to be done accurately. Now, in the farming industry, it's often quite large machines that will automatically move along and harvest large areas or water large areas or insecticide large areas or plant plants in large areas. They do things on big scale in farms. Of course, they want to um, scale things up so they're more profitable. That's their main focus. In the mining industry, it's much more involved around hazardous issues, but there are example like the really huge dump trucks are almost entirely autonomous yes they always have a driver in there just for a backup but they tend to move around autonomously following preset paths mostly again because of safety we want to make sure that they don't do anything um, untowards and human drivers unfortunately do tend to do things unpredictably whereas robots in the main don't so a robot arm is generally a device that's fixed in one location and it moves around and does things within a certain um, what's called degrees of movement or degrees of freedom of movement and a certain range. Doesn't have to be that. You can attach robot arms to mobile devices and move them around, but traditionally we see them as more fixed. And many schools do have some a robot arm that can be used. Um, an activity you can do with students is actually to create your own robot arms using syringes and plastic tubes and what's called pneumatics, um, air being pumped in and out. And you can make a cardboard robot arm that can pick up a, a, a can of drink and move it to another location, all by just physically manually moving various plungers. Uh, okay, so robot arms have a number of joints and these relate the more joints the more degrees of freedom they have the more different ways they can do things just as our arms and our wrists and our fingers all have and our shoulders provide us with a number of ways we can move our arms around to get to different locations if you've only got an arm on say one degree of freedom we can only go up and down then that's fairly limited two degrees of freedom might be you can go up and down and then left and right you can do a little bit more but still not that much more but when you start adding more um, joints, then it can do more things and be more flexible. 
Uh, but two degrees of freedom, we've got robot arms that can move around and we use them as plotters. Um, three degrees of freedom allow the plotters to go up and down and we can do 3D printing. So we do these a lot. You see these sort of simple robots a lot in industry. We just don't always call them robots. Okay, so this is an example where we have what's called displacement arms, which are printers and plotters, um, laser cutters, and CDC or um, cutting machines that move and cut out uh, metal and wood. And they simply move um, a, an attachment, like a, a hand, um, left and right, up and down, side, um, sideways and backwards and so forth. And we can attach various things to this hand. It might be a pen, it might be a laser, it might be a cutter, it might be a suction to pick things up, it might be a gripper. And by choosing the right attachments, we can do various things. Um, and indeed, students can come up with their own ways of doing things, such as being able to extrude different types of food. There are chocolate um, robots and pizza robots and a whole range of different um, cake decorating robots, which essentially work like a 3D printer works, but instead of um, extruding plastic, they extrude toppings or icing or various other um, food sources. So students can then learn about what's called additive processing, where they can you can build things by adding material um, progressively to, to that. And indeed, that's now how we're 3D printing houses, where we're extruding concrete instead of plastic, as we would see in a normal 3D printer. OK, and then we get to the mobile robots. These tend to be what we use more in primary schools. Probably the most complex of all the automation solutions, but also the most interesting and engaging for students. And their cost has come down dramatically over the last um, decade to where quite complex robots are now available in almost every classroom. Now, originally, many of these devices were remote controlled. You had a little device and you could move it forward and back with a little joystick and could move it around like a remote control car. That's not particularly useful in digital technologies because we can't automate it. We can move it around, but we have to physically do that ourselves. But more and more of these devices now can be controlled by a little computer on them, which can be programmed and we can give it a series of instructions using a Blockly type language. We can say move forward five paces, move left. The Bebop, the simplest of our robots, is a good example of that. We can give it instructions on how far to move forward, when to turn left, when to turn right, when to turn around, things of that nature. And it can then do some things. It doesn't have any sensors though, so it can't detect anything about the world. So it's rather limited in that respect. But many of our robot devices, we can attach sensors to, so it can detect when it's coming to the edge of a table, or it may be able to detect how far it's moved, or have a camera on it to detect if there's something in front of it. There's a whole range of sensors we can attach to robots that can then increase its functionality and ability to do things. Okay, so there's lots of robots becoming available, and we're going to go through a few of them um, today, just so that you're aware that there's new ones coming to education every year, and they're increasing in their functionality every year. So the B bots, which you've explored already, but there's also the blue bots, which actually can connect wirelessly to a computer through Bluetooth, which is where they get their name, um, and we can then give our instructions on our computer or our tablet and transmit those instructions to the bot and it will then follow out those in instructions. So we don't have to push the buttons on the top of the B bot to give it its instructions. So it adds a little bit of extra functionality, not a huge amount. And for very young students, there's probably not a huge advantage in that. Probots, a little bit more complex, um, look like a little remote control car but they've got a whole lot of buttons and a little LCD screen on them. And they can then be programmed again to move around just like a B-Bot, but um, they're a little bit larger. 
And one other advantage they have is that you can push a little pen through them so they can then draw as they move and you can draw different shapes. Now, some of the very original um, robots used in education done by the creative Mindstorms, uh, Seymour Papert, were what called the turtle robot, which looked quite a lot like the bee bot, but they had a pen stuck through them and it would be used to draw various diagrams. So that's what the, the three bee bot family robots look like, uh, the bee bot, the blue bot and the pro bot. And they have various advantages and disadvantages. Um, again, they don't have any sensors. So while they can be, they're good at following instructions and they will do things as we command them to do, they can't take in any information about the world and then respond based upon that information, what we call input sensors. Now the Ozobots are really small little robots that go a step up from the B-Bots. Um, the advantage of these is that they can be programmed and we can then program them and then give the instructions from our tablets or our computers to these devices and they will then follow out the devices. They also have a little sensor underneath which can detect different colors. So they can then detect what color line they're on and they can also follow the line. Right, as they move along, if they detect they're moving off the line, they'll then move back onto the line. So they've got two little wheels underneath. So the robot can then move around following lines. One of the other interesting capabilities of the Ozobots is that it can then detect different changes in colors of the lines. So it might see that it's going over a little bit of red, then blue, then black. And we can then program the robot to respond to those changes. So we can give instructions by drawing the instructions on the lines. So if it goes over red, blue, black, it may then be the instruction to turn around or to turn left at, at it comes to the next intersection or to change the lights on the device. So we can have it respond to the environment. And that gives us some input capability and also an interesting way of programming. So students can actually program their robots by drawing out their lines and they can make nice little fun patterns and, and so forth. The Dash and Dot robots are actually really complex robots. They've got quite a lot of artificial intelligence in them. They've got cameras that can detect individual students and recognize them. And you can program them then to respond to different students in different ways. Um, but also because there's two of them, you can have them respond to each other. So you can program them so that when the Dash robot sees the Dot robot, it will then do different things. And you can put them around and rearrange things to have things occur based upon the robots themselves being input devices for each other. And then in this diagram or in this picture, you can see some of the attachments. There's a little catapult attachment and a xylophone attachment. So you can have the robots play music and throw balls around and, and start doing some more complex things. But they've got speakers and cameras, so they've got a lot more input about what's happening in the world. So you could have it, you could play a different piece of music when it detects a different student. Um, and interesting little approaches like that. So more and more input devices, more and more complexity that we can do with our um, robots. But still, we can program them using Blockly to respond to these various different um, interactions. Another popular set of robots are the Spheros, which are as the name suggests, spheres, they're balls that have various magnets in them that allow them to move around and roll. Now we saw this in the movie Star Wars, um, where we had the um, BB-8 robot, which used the same technology. In fact, it was made by the same company. They're really popular in our younger years, but their disadvantage is they're not very accurate. So having them automate tasks form the same task the same way, such as going in a square, is relatively difficult because they move around too quickly and a little bit too erratically. But still, they're a lot of fun for our young, children, uh, young students. And having them move around and programming them to do different things, again, we can be programmed in Blockly or Block-based languages to do various commands and instructions. Um, so going through a maze, for example, having them programmed to do that. Good activities, teaches some basic concepts around sequencing, 
but it doesn't help where we want to teach about branching or iteration very much. Okay, so the key aspect for our young years is that we want to teach about sequence. That's the, the key focus in years F to 2. So having a robot that can simply perform a set of instructions and move a particular way through a particular um, activity is fine. That's what we want to teach. Great devices for doing that. We don't need to take in a lot of other sensor information and do different things in terms of different um, uh, sensor data. But eventually, we do want to be able to do more complex things. But there are tools that can branch that divide. Um, the Lego We Do kits have been very popular for young children again. Um, they use a simplified form of the block-based programming, just using images, where students can put a sequence of images together and then control various motors on simple Lego constructions. And the advantage of that is they can make different um, objects and try them out in different ways, change different gears, and explore various aspects that Lego has been um, traditionally so powerful in allowing students in terms of their creativity. So again, key aspect around learning about digital systems for F2 is that devices have an input where we can have buttons and sensors that allow things to, to do di different things. They have a computer's brain, the, the CPU, the processor, which controls what happens and runs the program, runs the algorithm, the instructions that allow us the robot to do different things. And then we have outputs, which might be move various wheels or make lights flash or sounds occur. And we can write the algorithms that allow the robots or the, any digital device to do these things for us. We control how the device works. Of course, we write the algorithms. We are empowered to make the device do what we want it to be able to do. That's the core learning in F2 around digital systems. Some other ways of helping in teaching this are um, instruction cards that students can lay out and then have the robot follow the cards. Or even if they um, sometimes have, have the students walk the cards themselves, pretending that they're the robots. But following these instructions exactly, because that's, again, remember the key learning in the early years is that we have algorithms, the robot will perform them exactly. And if we tell, give it the wrong instructions, the robot will do things differently to what we expected. The robot isn't doing them wrong, we programmed it wrong. Okay, then in years three to six, we start introducing more complex robots and they can do more and more complex tasks. They've got more sensors, more motors, more articulation in terms of arms and various other things that they can do. So there's a range of different kits that have been introduced and made available um, to schools. Some of them more expensive than others. Um, and it is a relatively high cost for robotic kits. Um, that said, many schools are investing in this. They do see a fair bit of prestige around having these devices used or even owned by the school. And so particularly some of the private schools, they invest a lot of money into these technologies, but most primary schools have got some robotic type automated automation capable devices that can be utilized. Okay, so the Edison kits are an Australian robot um, that again, very simple, it's a little brick, a couple of wheels and some sensors. So some sensors detected to something in front of it. And if there's, if there's a line underneath it, in different colors or different shades, um, and it can be programmed by computers and tablets. And it has a particular way of programming where we can hold it up to a speaker and we can send signals from the computer to the device using sound from the computer speaker or tablet speaker. Or it can be connected up with wires and other ways. And it's a reasonably good device, but, and it does have some connection points where you can attach Lego devices to it. So you can build some things around it, but it's still relatively limited. Um, but still more powerful than devices such as the V-Box. 
Then you've got the Lego Mindstorms kits, which are now being renamed Robot Inventor kits, which have been very popular in education for 50 years. Um, they were developed for education initially, but unfortunately they're tending to be a little bit more focused on commercial kits for home use now and away from um, the creative processes we focus on in, in schools, uh, whereby students are given instructions to build particular robots rather than provided with a whole lot of equipment, a whole lot of materials and uh, wheels and motors and gears and stuff and allowed to be creative in their development of solutions. So that's what the new Mindstorm kits look like. Um, and you can see there, it's sort of got instructions to build five different types of robots. Now, it's not to say that you still can't be creative with these kits. Lego, by its nature, is still a very creative environment. It can be broken down and um, engaged with in different ways. And they can be coded. And you see, it can be coded or controlled. So you can use a remote control. You can use them as remote control toys or you can program them using programming code. So still very useful. Um, but there are now competitors in this environment. The VEX kits are very popular in the United States, similar to Lego, but based more around the Meccano style construction, where you've got beams and connecting beams together and, and building out more complex devices. And they also expend, extend into metal construction kits. So you can build really complex robust robotic devices in the older years and progress from younger to older in the same sort of environment. But as with Lego, they provide a flexible environment in which to design and create your own um, solutions to problems. And that's just what these kits look like in one particular configuration. Then you've got the kits from China in particular called MakerBots, which are Again, well, they're all metal in this case, um, and you connect them together and you with screws and little uh, connectors. But they tend to be quite powerful in that they're designed to make lots of sophisticated solutions, including plotters and 3D printers and robots and robot arms. And, and you can use the same kit to do lots and lots of really complex stuff. They're a little bit more technical. They tend to be built off an Adreno robotic, robotic um, uh, little computer. And so while you don't have to be involved in soldering, you do have to screw them together and you can, they're more complex in that respect than the VEX and the Lego kits, which rely upon other sorts of more easily connectable ways of building the devices. But they are incredibly powerful and also quite a bit cheaper than the other uh, robotic kits. So if you've got the confidence and capabilities and you've got the students that are really interested in building these sorts of solutions, and again, this can go um, very much into design and technology learning outcomes as well, then certainly these Adreno microcontroller um, MakeBot kits can be very powerful. And you can use them to, well, all of these robot kits can then be used to automate various processes starters such as building an automatic garden. So it will um, go and water the plants. Um, it might detect weeds and actually pick the weeds out. Actually, you can actually build robot kits that can do that. And there's also lots of competitions that students can go into. Um, there's the robot cut competitions where students can compete with dance, having robots do different dance routines um, through to having robots make their way through mazes and buildings to rescue an object and, and make its way back out through to robots playing soccer against one another with a, um, a little ball that the robots detect and they work together to get the ball into um, the goalpost while the opponent's robots are doing the opposite. Again, very popular. And then there's also the sumo robots where the robots compete against one another to push each other outside of a ring. Um, one that the online students will be exploring in tutorial. So these all rely upon algorithms and programming. The students have to give instructions to their robots. And then there's even the robot battle competitions where the robots try to defeat one another. A little bit like the sumo competition, but 
in the most extreme, they're trying to destroy one another. We don't tend to do that in schools, but they're certainly very popular in TV programs and in some other competitions. But they tend to be a little bit too violent for our focus in education. Okay, so through all of this, students should be exploring how robots can be designed to solve problems and to improve the user experience. So we're trying to have the, these solutions to problems make the world a better place. But being able to use robots is an important aspect. What is it like to be served food by a robot waiter? And to give instructions to the robot waiter on what food we want to have ordered and for it to then bring that food to us. How does that change the dining experience? If we're an elderly patient in a nursing home, having a robot that can lift us out of bed and take us to the bathroom and then take us back to, the, to bed under our instructions may give us a greater sense of independence than having to rely upon a nurse and an orderly to do that for us. So particularly with people with disabilities, a lot of automated devices have been designed and built specifically for them. Um, tends to be more funding available to make one-off solutions. So a lot of exploration is done in the disability space. But once they're then developed for that solution, because they are generalizable, remember that concept in abstraction, they can be then applied to other uses. The tablet computer was generally first used in for disabilities, as was voice recognition. Um, but once it was then achieved a certain level of development that was useful for those with um, impairments, it was then realized that everyone could make benefit of that. And so increasingly it's then become commercialized and popularized in a whole range of other uses. So have a look now at another couple of quick video clips. One is on the different ways that the maker block kits can be used. And the other is an example of a robot kitchen where automated processes may be coming to our home kitchens in the near future. And that could very much change how we have our dining experiences, even in our own homes. Okay, so hopefully you've had a look at the different abilities of the maker block and the robot kitchen. Now we're going to look at our last automated set of technologies, and this is around drones, which are becoming increasingly popular around the world. Um, yes, they were probably first initially developed for the military in order to be able to, well, initially it was for reconnaissance to be able to see things that they couldn't necessarily see with other sensor devices, but increasingly they've also been able to be used for the deployment of weapons and to target um, the enemy and destroy things. Again, not things we want to focus on in schools, but there are lots of other uses where drones are being applied. Here on the Gold Coast, surf rescue is a very popular use for drones, as is um, creating videos for real estate agents to showcase uh, homes. But in terms of surf rescue, there's a number of these being trialed in, on beaches, whereby the drones are flown along. So in the past, we've had to rely upon helicopters flying along the beach to detect people or to see sharks and other things that might be problematic. Now it's much cheaper and easier to fly drones along. And the other advantage is the drones can be carrying an emergency device um, that can be then dropped to someone that's in distress and it will then inflate and they can then hold on to that while they await rescue. So increasingly improving the response time. Uh, likewise, it's being trialed to have a defibrillator attached to the drone. So the drone can quickly get to where someone is having a heart attack and provide them with access to a defibrillator, whereas it might take many more minutes for someone to run down with that device. Again, problems being solved. And indeed, here in um, Queensland, in Brisbane, um, Logan City in particular, for a number of years, they've been trialling um, food delivery via drones. Um, 
particularly with pizza delivery. So the idea of being able to have drones fly around our communities, delivering um, various th um, things that people want in a timely manner. Okay, so drones are essentially what are called unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. Now we started with remote controlled planes and helicopters, but eventually we could incorporate computers onto these devices, just like we have um, automated, automated pilots on large commercial planes. We could start putting the same sorts of computerized pilots on our small remote control planes. And then we realized that once we had a computer on board, we could start adding more helicopter blades because without a computer, it was too unstable. It was, you couldn't react to all the different variances. But with a computer on board controlling these different um, motors, it became a very stable platform for being able to fly around. Whereas a helicopter or a plane has to be continuously in rapid movement to be able to remain stable. Um, once you have four or more blades, it can hover in the one spot indefinitely with very little um, computer processing involvement. And the other advantage is now we can give it instructions on how to move around, how to take off and land, how to move left and right, forward and backs. And very accurately, it can now be given instructions to move. Now, many of you may have used remote control drones where you move them around with joysticks and so forth, but they can also be controlled using block-based programming languages or any programming language um, and given accurate instructions to move um, from point A to point B and, and back again. Now, by attaching sensors, we can also then have it react to various things. So with block-based programming, we can give it instructions on how to move around and this is an uh, image of the Lego drones. So Lego has its own drone where you can build it out of Lego um, and fly it around and change its configurations and have 10 motors instead of just four and various other sensors. So just like with um, any other robot, but students can develop solutions to problems. So for example, having a robot drone fly up and provide teachers with playground duty so that they can see where all the students are and what they're doing without leaving the staff room or looking for lost balls and frisbees sitting on the roof of the playground buildings. Um, so lots of different things that can be done. Some of the robots can have claws and other attachments that we can pick up things and drop things off. We may have tuck shop deliveries via drones. Um, so there could be a whole range of different things that students could explore as solutions using these particular robot devices. Of course, a robot, a drone is simply a robot that can move in three dimensions instead of two. Um, and they can collect data. Having a drone go up and take a photo of the school. So you've got then an image of the whole school. Um, it may be able to go up and using image recognition software, count how many students are in the playground. A whole range of different things that might be possible. It could. Um, look at different temperatures at different heights, um, different wind speeds, whole range of things that students could explore regarding weather, using this as another uh, platform to collect data. And the other advantage is that they can then process this data on board and that they can then have ways of making their way around environments completely autonomously. Um, Initially, this was built in as a safety mechanism. So if the robot lost the signal, it would be able to fly back to where it started from and avoid any trees or people or other objects that it might encounter along its way. But increasingly now, we can have drones that go out and essentially do their own thing and then come back with the data that they've collected or whatever they, they were sent out to do um, without even really needed to have been programmed. That starts getting a bit more complex than what we do in primary school. But it's certainly not beyond students' capabilities to do particularly with more um, advanced drones. Okay, so essentially drones are really useful in teaching sequence and iteration, um, being able to perform tasks the same way, the same a number of times and follow a whole series of instructions. And also with object detection and things like that, it can then make decisions and we can look at also 
um, that aspect of programming. The other advantage of drones is they can be useful for teaching students about networking and communication. Drones, by their nature, have to have some sort of communication with the computer that's giving its instructions. Well, sure, they don't have to. They can fly completely autonomously if they need to. But in the main, we have a device that's controlling the drones, um, and we need to have some sort of communication between that. And if that communication is lost, then the drone may have to follow some instructions to either get back into range for the communication or to fly back to where it's started from, or if it can't do that, then to land safely in Okay, so a couple of practical aspects about drones though. Of course, they are considered an aircraft. Um, they do fall under the regulations of the Civil Aviation Authority. Now, it sounds really scary having to follow those instructions, but it's not that complex. I've had to deal with them quite a lot. I used to run a rocketry club in school and we were actually quite close to an aerodrome. So I had to contact the Civil Aviation Authority and the, um, the control tower when we wanted to launch our little rockets. Um, and they were quite happy to accommodate that. Likewise with drones, they're, they're more than happy to help out. But there are strict rules and regulations around how drones can be used out of doors. Of course, they do have the potential to fly into the path of a plane or a helicopter and other things of that nature. So even though these rules are broken very regularly by individuals, in our communities, as teachers, you need do need to follow the rules quite stringently, and you need to teach your students about these rules. Now, probably the main rule that, or main thing you need to understand is that the rules only apply if you're outside. Now, unfortunately, in what are called multi-purpose shelters, if you've got one wall that's open to the outside, that still counts as being outside. It needs to be fully enclosed. It doesn't need to be airtight and all the windows have to be closed, but it does need to be an enclosed building. Um, and if it's enclosed, then the rules don't apply. Health and safety rules do apply. Um, you do still need to consider that. I always make students wear um, classic glasses um, and I tend to get um, girl students to tie their hair back and some of the boy students nowadays as well. <laughs> of course, you don't want these blades wrapping themselves around hair. But most of the drones used in schools are very low impact. They're plastic blades. Um, it's very unlikely to, to be able to cut skin even going at their full speed. There is some potential though for the eyes, so do need to take concern around that. But in the main, they're not dangerous devices. Um, many of them also can be enclosed completely in plastic cages. Uh, which can reduce their danger um, as well. And some schools also put up some netting and the drones have been flown within a netted environment um, while the students stay outside of the netted area. So there's many ways of mitigating risks and reducing potential for problems. That said, drones have been used in schools for a long time now and I haven't heard of any significant incident occurring. Most teachers are quite hypersensitive to potential risks involving students, so um, we're much more careful than the general population. But that said, they are used in a lot of schools and um, quite responsibly. However, if you go outside, you then come under the Civil Aviation Authority rules. And the most important rule is they can't be flown within 30 metres of someone else, um, which is rather a significant constraint when you've got a large number of students. Now, the rule can be interpreted that you can have one person with them if they're both involved in managing the control of the drone, but that's still only two people. Um, there are various other rules, such as you have to be within visual, visual, um, have to be able to visibly observe the drone at all times. Uh, this prevents you wearing 3D headsets unless you're part of a special club that's involved in what's called first person view drone racing, which is a lot of fun. And some schools have gone to the um, processes of setting up clubs to allow them students to race drones in that way, or you can do them inside, in which case the rules don't apply. Um, but if you're flying them outside, um, you can't use uh, these sort of goggles. Likewise, you can't fly them beyond the distance you can see the drone. 
this does present some difficulties with the more advanced drones now, which can fly 10 kilometers away if they're automated to fly and do various um, patterns and then fly back. Um, under the CASA rules, you can't do that unless you get a drone pilot's license and um, go to the expense of doing that, which some schools aren't doing. Um, high schools, I haven't heard of any primary schools doing pilot licenses for drone flights yet, but it may happen. Okay, so there are management issues around use of drones, but they can be very successfully used inside and they really just represent another type of robot and students will fly them as they would um, any other device. Okay, so that's it for automation this week. In your tutorials, before the tutorial, I'd like you to have a look at the If Then Then That um, website and automate um, a reminder email so that you can receive a, an email on a particular date and have a look at the various other automation um, inputs and outputs that you can see on the site and think about what you might have at home that could be automated to then um, automate other elements of your house. Then in the tutorials, if you're in the on-campus group, you're going to be using a set of robots called Kai Clan. This is a company in New Zealand that's made some quite advanced robots um, that can also incorporate aspects of augmented reality. And we're go going to use those to explore various um, environments to solve problems. Um, these sorts of robot kits have various mats or various sort of um, themes. It might be a, a warehouse where you've got picking up various elements of a warehouse as though you were running an automated warehouse environment. It might be under the sea or it might be moving around a town. Or a common one is Mars. Of course, sending robots to Mars to pick up rocks and to take um, sensor readings and so forth is a common experience in science and so having robots um, use the mars maps to do various activities is what you're going to be doing in your tutorial and there'll be a range of different challenges for you to program your robots to carry out instructions to perform tasks that we would see happening with robots on mars uh, particularly in the development of, of um, space settlements Now, for our online students, um, we're not getting you to purchase uh, robot kits. So you're going to be using some robot simulators or a robot simulator called Gears. So this will allow you to program a virtual robot to perform a range of tasks. So um, there'll be a range of different activities for you to go through in programming your robot simu uh, your simulated robot. And Hopefully you'll get to the point whereby you can program it to perform a sumo competition where you're trying to push objects outside of a ring. And if all goes well, with the support of your tutor, you'll be able to then um, upload your um, sumo code, the instructions, the algorithm for programming your sumo robot to your tutor, who will then run a little competition with um, teams of four sumo robots fighting against one another to push each other outside of the ring and see how that goes. Again, a popular competition at the moment in primary schools with robots. Okay, so that's it for automation this week. And I hope you've gained a better understanding of the different elements involved in particularly the use of robotics in teaching automation, but automation in general as another context for solving problems with students' capabilities as they're developing in digital technologies.